everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Linda and I am with the Fort Worth Public Library's Genealogy, Local History and Archives Unit. And before we get started, I have a couple of announcements to make. The Fort Worth Public Library is participating in the American Library Association's Libraries Transform campaign. Please join us September 14th through 28th as we read Book of the Little Acts by Lauren Francis Sharma, available through the Fort Worth Public Library with no wait list on the Libby app. The Facebook group will discuss this compelling saga of family bonds, ambitions, and desires. Please contact the library if you need help accessing the book or the Facebook group. Also, this month's speaker for the library's author series is Jose Ralat, Texas Monthly Magazine taco editor and author of American Tacos, History and Guide. This event is on September 16th at 6 p.m. on Zoom. Please see the library's author visits and book signings page to find the Zoom registration link. We're excited to have you here with us today as we start off our series of community history workshops. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Leanna Schooley, Executive Director of TCU's Center for Texas Studies, to introduce their speaker. Thank you, Linda. We are so pleased to be here. Uh, we wish we could all see you in person at the library like we normally would, but we are pleased to see the numbers and our participants just going up and up just as if we were at the library. So we are just delighted. Um, you are here for food as cultural identity, European, African, and indigenous foods and crops in America. Before I introduce our speaker, I just want to tell you that the Preserving Our Past uh, Community Workshop Series is uh, generously funded by the Summerfield G. Roberts Foundation and the Summerlee Foundation, who make it possible for us to bring in speakers um, both near and far to talk about all things that make uh, Texas unique and distinctive. Uh, and certainly our topic today, talking about food is one of those things. I wanna mention that you can find out more about what we do and our upcoming programs on Instagram and on Facebook. So please look for us there under our Center for Texas Studies. Uh, and I wanna mention that our next program, which will also be virtual, will be Dr. Brian Cervantes, and he is going to talk about Eamon Carter, A Lone Star Life, his recent biography on Eamon Carter, and that will be on October the 10th. So soon we will be putting out the links for that program and we'll want you to register for those too. Now, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, as we go through the program today and you come up with questions you might like us to discuss at the end, please direct your questions to Peter to us through the Q&A link, which you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can also use the chat function if that works better for you. And we will moderate those questions and present them to Peter at the end. But you can, uh, you can insert your questions at any time as you think of them. Now, Dr. P Peter Martinez is the Associate Professor of History at Tarrant County College Northeast Campus. He has a BA and an MA from UT in, uh, UTA in history. He got his PhD in 2017 from UNT and his dissertation won the best dissertation in Tejano Tejana Studies from the National Association for Chicana and Chicano Studies. Um, he uh, has lived, he's a native of San Antonio, but has lived in Fort Worth for many years and he serves on the Fort Worth Latino History Group and is a board member there. So uh, with that, I wanna turn the program over to Peter and I have a feeling that by the time we're done today, we will definitely all be ready for lunch. So please welcome Peter Martinez. Hi, it's good to see everybody or hopefully see everybody today. I'm glad to present today in Fort Worth uh, for the Fort Worth Library and TCU. Uh, I'm going to just introduce myself real quickly again, as Dr. Scully just mentioned. Uh, I do have this background in Mexican American studies. Uh, I came upon this idea of looking at the history of our foods really last year during Hispanic Heritage Month activity with, with uh, Tarrant County College Northeast. And I decided to kind of expand on that, uh, really investigating the history of foods altogether in the Americas and 
exploring this idea of the Columbian Exchange and its effects long term on culture and life, uh, population, and so forth. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and share my PowerPoint, and uh, we'll go and uh, start right now. So it'll be just a minute while I pull that up. Okay, and we'll start off first of all with this uh, idea of food and collective memory. Uh, now, uh, collective memory meaning this uh, memory or group of memories shared or recollected by a group as a community or culture. Uh, this idea that you know when you think about food, you know. And, and, uh, and meals that you eat, you think about holidays, you think about your family, you think about your childhood, right? This same sense comes with smells, right? You hear about this all the time where smells jog memories. Well, if you look at certain foods, like right off the bat, you look at a Cadbury egg and right off the bat, I'm thinking that you're probably thinking Easter time, right? If you saw a Cadbury egg like this going into Christmas or Halloween or even 4th of July, you would kind of wonder, why are we doing this? What's, what's the purpose of having this Cadbury egg? It's totally misplaced because we know that Cadbury eggs really belong to Easter, right? Uh, this is a bit, you know, something that's part of American culture ingrained. Uh, growing up, I saw Cadbury eggs at the grocery store, at the checkout line, you know, in the month or so, six weeks or so leading up to Easter, uh, maybe even longer than that. Now, for Easter in my Mexican background, my dad is... Uh, of Mexican descent. His mother, uh, Berta Santian, uh, was born in San Antonio. She was the first in her family born uh, in the United States. Uh, her family came to the United States during the uh, Mexican uh, Revolution. Uh, so they came somewhere around 1915 or 1916, and then my grandmother was born in 1917. Uh, so growing up, I ate a lot of Mexican food. We went to my grandmother's house quite a bit. Um, I always tell people that uh, I never went to a chain Mexican food restaurant until I was probably around 17, 16 or 17 years of age. Uh, I never went to an on the border or anything like that. Um, we always had homemade Mexican food, you know, even if it was my dad or my mom. Now, my mom is uh, Anglo-Saxon. She is not Mexican descent, uh, but she lived most of her life in San Antonio, and my parents were married for almost 50 years before my mom passed away recently. Uh, so she was very much in touch with this uh, Mexican background as well. And she learned to cook a lot of Mexican food from my grandmother. And of course, my dad also cooked. Uh, so when I think of Easter, I also think of capirotada. That's this dish right over here. Uh, those who eat a lot of Mexican food or those who have a lot of this Mexican background are probably going to be familiar with capirotada. Again, this is going to be something that you see around Easter time that you kind of associate with that time of year and that holiday, that culture. When we look at this, uh, you see a plate full of gingerbread men, you know it's coming, coming up to Christmas time, right? Uh, uh, you don't see gingerbread men when you, uh, in American culture in February, March, or April. You're not going to see this as going over the summer or going through the uh, holiday or Halloween season. This is something you see when you get up to Christmas. So as soon as you see a gingerbread man or a gingerbread house, you immediately associate this food with not only the Christmas season, but if you participate in baiting, making gingerbread cookies or gingerbread houses and you get up in age, these may draw a lot of the memories that you have from your childhood of things that you used to do, right? This is part of your culture, part of what's ingrained in you. And in the same way, uh, I feel that way about buñuelos, right? Buñuelos, is, uh, if you're not familiar with this, and I think a lot of you may be, uh, this is going to be the kind of like, it's almost like a fried tortilla with different toppings, you know, cinnamon, sugar, other toppings can be put on this. But again, this is something that we, we always ate growing up, uh, going into like Christmas and New Year's. Uh, we never had buñuelos outside of that period of time. If I would have seen buñuelos uh, during that different period of time, uh, or outside of my family, it would have been very strange, right? This is something that's really associate, that I associate with my own personal history and with me Mexican culture, more generally speaking. So what we're doing is we're kind of laying the groundwork right now with uh, these ideas of how food plays a big role in culture. And then how do we view food over time? How do Europeans view food and livestock? How do indigenous people view food and livestock? Uh, this will cross over, right? Uh, we're going to see this exchange. Now, in particular, we will be looking at a few areas. Uh, 
it would be really difficult for me to cover a lot of different areas. Um, it would probably take several sessions. So I'm going to specifically be looking at uh, Mexico. And of course, Mexico will have a lot of influence on Texas. Uh, we'll be looking a little bit at, at Puerto Rico. Uh, we'll look uh, a little bit at Peru and we'll go all the way down to Argentina. So these are gonna be the main areas that we're looking at as uh, Mexico, uh, Puerto Rico, Peru and Argentina, just to kind of outline some of those differences. I'm staying away from more Portuguese influenced areas uh, or French and British influenced areas on the east and northeast coast. I'm sticking more with a Spanish tradition. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Now this is a, a pretty generic image, but it's a clear image. So I like to use this image because it outlines uh, and indicates a lot of the foods uh, and animals along with disease, of course, that are spread around the world as we go through the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries and beyond. So of course, most of you or maybe many of you are probably familiar with this term, you know, the Columbian exchange, right? That exchange uh, of culture, foods, and livestock, along with disease around the world that stems from European expansion into the Americas. And really it's remarkable when you think about some of the foods and livestock that weren't in the Americas five or 600 years ago that are totally ingrained as part of American culture. And they say the same thing about Europe or Asia or Africa, right? And you couldn't imagine having Italian food nowadays without tomatoes, right? Uh, marinara sauce, pizza, whatever you're cooking with Italian, you tend to think of tomato-based uh, sauces. Uh, when you think about Ireland, right, you immediately think about potatoes, right? Potatoes are definitely a part of, of Ireland, uh, the Irish diet. diet. Uh, not only that, but if you think about England, right, the first food that comes to my mind when I think about England is fish and chips. Chips, of course, stemming from potatoes, and they don't have potatoes until we get into like the you know, late 16th, early 17th century. Uh, so, you know, what we think of culturally in Europe or in the Americas is really based upon this migration of foods, uh, animals, uh, and, and people. Uh, and then if we go down here, of course, Swiss chocolate would also be a part. And when we think about Switzerland, of course, we're going to think about cocoa or chocolate. Uh, so that, that would be another part. Uh, likewise, if you look at the foods that are coming from Europe and, the, and Africa, uh, we think about, you know, cows, right? Where would Texas be without cows? You know, we have the Texas Longhorns, Fort Worth is cow town, but there are no cows until the Spanish bring those cows over here, right? So that's a big part of who we are. We think about uh, Texas food, right? You think about tacos, you think about brisket, you, uh, you, you think about all these things that we weren't here before we have this mixture of indigenous and European influence over time, right? This is building who we are, our diet. And when I say who we are, uh, the Europeans took that quite literally once we get into the 16th and 17th centuries. And I'll explain what I mean uh, when I say took it literally in just a, a minute or two. But again, keep in the back of your mind that when these Europeans will make their way over to the Americas, and of course, they'll bring slaves as well once we get into the 16th century for sure. They are bringing the cows, sheep, pigs, and horses. Uh, so we're gonna have a little bit of a discussion about European impressions of indigenous foods when they make their way over, kind of questioning why they are eating certain foods and not really eating other types of foods. But understand that these foods are totally foreign to European minds and concepts uh, when they make their way across to the Americas. Uh, now, again, just looking at this, another thing that we're gonna come bring to mind is this idea of wheat and rice in particular when we're talking about uh, the foods in places like Puerto Rico, Mexico, uh, and across Central and South America, right? Uh, where would we be without rice? Uh, and of course, Wheat plays a big role in tortillas and other items. Of course, if you go to Mexico, you'll probably see more corn-based or more maize than, than wheat. 
Uh, but again, when we're talking about Texas in particular, you know, we really associate tacos with the with the wheat tortillas with the mixture of the uh, corn as well. I'm going to show this real quick just to make sure that we have a nice background on where the Europeans initially go. So we're going to start with Christopher Columbus, of course, right? So Christopher Columbus, if you look at this map, you'll see it's 1492. He'll make his way down from Spain to the Canary Islands in August of 1492. And then going through from September into early October, uh, he will make his way across the Atlantic Ocean, of course, looking for this route to Asia, not realizing there's two huge continents in between Europe and Asia going around the world. And he winds up hitting San Salvador. He'll hit several other islands, make his way back, reports back to King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella that he's found India. He wants to get some, a lot of money in, since he found this shorter route to India. Of course, they don't really believe him. So he makes another trip out in 1493. At this point, he'll hit Puerto Rico, uh, which again, we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, he'll make his way back. And then he'll make two more trips, right? 1498, he'll hit South America. 1502, he'll make his way into Central America as well. Uh, so every time he comes, he's gonna bring more Spanish people and more Spanish people will start taking over bits and pieces of American land in the Caribbean, Central America, and South America. So this is where we're gonna start seeing that interaction of European and indigenous people right here, right in, right in the 1490s, early 1500s. And it's gonna spread fairly rapidly, especially once we get to Cortes, and Pizarro in taking over the Aztec Empire and the Incan Empire. So we're setting the stage for this interaction, this uh, cultural exchange that we're gonna have and biological exchange. I wanna make sure that everybody's familiar with Galen. Uh, Galen will build on these ideas from Hippocrates early on. Galen is, was, was this uh, Greco-Roman physician and philosopher from the second century. And he, he uses these ideas that again, Hippocrates kind of discussed, Aristotle discusses some of these ideas as well uh, about having these you know, humors, you know, these four humors. Uh, and Galen proposes that you have these balance, this balance of the four humors in the human body. And that balance in the human body is basically this balance of yellow bile, blood bile, I'm sorry, <laughs> yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood, right? Those are gonna be your four humors. Uh, in order for you to be healthy, those four humors have to be balanced. Uh, that makes up who you are, right? That bile, the yellow, yellow and black bile, the phlegm, and the blood comprise your physical condition. Uh, now, again, this is going to be a, a very prevalent idea all the way into the 19th century, right? This, when you think about bleeding somebody out to try to heal them because they have a high temperature, uh, that, that really comes from, you know, Galen's theory. So again, this, these ideas are around for a long time. In fact, George Washington will die as a result of bloodletting uh, because they're still using Galen's theory in the late 1700s. So, uh, make sure we understand how Europeans are thinking about your physical health, right? And, and what you consume affects your four humors. Uh, so your intake affects who you are biologically, according to Europeans. And this kind of changes the balance of your four biles. And Europeans are going to kind of think of this as being advanced or essentially backwards, right? How progressive, how modern you are biologically and sociologically, politically, uh, through religious beliefs, right? All of this is going to start affecting one another like a, like a chain reaction. So we'll look at this slide real quick, right? Now we're gonna start applying Galen's theory now that we've made our way in. Now, Christopher Columbus, of course, will argue that he found a shorter, faster route to Asia, right? He goes back over and over again with this whole idea that he's gonna prove that he found Asia. Until the day he dies, he argues that he found Asia. So instead, we're not gonna name the Americas after him, we're gonna name it after a guy named Amerigo Vespucci, 
who explores the region, interviews people, discusses people, uh, writes down uh, notes and, and uh, kind of a, keeps a journal of his adventures and writes letters to different people to describe what the Americas are like. In one of the letters, he mentions this, right? Amerindians, uh, Amerindians are much vitiated in the phlegm and in the blood because of their food, which consists chiefly of roots and herbs. So they're, they're backwards, they're weak. Uh, he's arguing, Amerigo Vespucci is, that the, Amer the Amerindians, the indigenous people of the Americas are not as strong, they're not as healthy, they're not as good as Europeans. And the reason is because of their food, which is affecting their phlegm and the blood, part of Galen's theory. So that's gonna be part of it. Now we're gonna expand a little bit, right? This is part of what America Vespucci talks about is the vitiation from, uh, from the food, chiefly roots and herbs. And he goes on to say that they have no seeds of wheat nor other grain. So not only are they backwards, but they really don't have any hope of advancing to be like us because they don't have the wheat or other grain that has made us a more advanced population, uh, right? When, when we're looking at Europe, they're really building off of wheat, rye, and barley. Uh, but Amerigo Pucci says they don't have that. So if they don't have that and all they're eating is roots and herbs, oh, and maybe some human flesh, they're not gonna be able to be as advanced as us. So what we're gonna to have to do is bring more wheat over to them and give them some of our food. That way they can become more like us. Now, by the way, this will work the other way around too. So we're gonna come back to that idea. But, but America Vespucci early on is saying they eat little flesh, but human flesh, right? Keep in mind, we're, the Europeans are bringing over the pigs, they're bringing over sheep, and they're bringing over cows. And generally, when we're thinking about eating meats in our world today, in America, in Texas, in Fort Worth, we think about eating cows and pigs. And those are being brought over by the Europeans. So the, he, he argued that these Amerindians are only eating, or generally speaking, they eat very little flesh, but human flesh. He goes on to say in another letter in 1503, uh, this will be to the Medici family or Medici, uh, they slaughter those who are captured and the victors eat the vanquished. For human flesh is an ordinary article of food among them, right? Human flesh is an ordinary article of food. I've seen a man eat his children and wife. And I knew a man who was popularly credited to have eaten 300 humans, right? I couldn't imagine going to a buffet uh, in this day and age, where you're basically just eating person after person after person. He goes on to say, I was once in a certain city where human flesh was hung up near the houses in the same way as we expose butcher's meat, right? So uh, we don't see butcher's meat hanging down from in windows anymore, but I've seen a lot of movies and TV shows from ages past where you walk by the butcher shop and you see a piece of meat that attracts you and you go buy that piece of meat, right? When you think about a, a Christmas Carol and Ebenezer Scrooge walks by the store and he gets, sees the big goose and he buys the biggest goose for Bob Cratchit, right? That's what we're thinking about. But in, according to Amerigo Vespucci, the Amerindians are doing that with people. Now, we're gonna show a couple of things that will kind of build off of what Vespucci and some other European explorers are doing. Now, this is a map, a world map, that was the first to depict a separate Western Hemisphere with the Pacific as a separate ocean. But again, this is really built upon Amerigo Vespucci's account. So you can see uh, Europe uh, pretty well defined, right? Uh, Spain is certainly there. Uh, you can make their way over to Italy. You can make your way down to Greece. Uh, it's pretty easy to see Europe uh, it, it pretty well. Uh, you go across and then you can see South America detailed pretty well. North America, not so much, right? North America looks really, really small still, but South America you can see is pretty big and they know that there's another ocean on the other side. So we're getting that mainly based upon Amerigo Vespucci. 
Now, we go on to see this woodcut. This is a German woodcut of a New World scene that was produced somewhere around 1505, right? Amerindians enjoying a cannibal feast. Additional parts uh, hang from the rafters, right? This is kind of dis uh, showing what Amerigo Vespucci is discussing when he's talking about foods in the Americas, right? Foods in the Americas uh, appear to be roots and people. So you can see uh, the caravels in the horizon showing that the Europeans are making their way over, right? So uh, the kind of the impression is Europeans are going to come over here and maybe change things. And this is what they're kind of coming into. Uh, but you can see body parts hanging. You can see people gnawing on arms and legs, right? Uh, people feeding their children other people, right? So this is the this is how Europeans are thinking about Americans and their, I'm sorry, indigenous Americans and their diets when we're looking at the you know, early 16th century. Not only that, but Amerindians, these indigenous people in the Americas also ate a lot of other things that Europeans didn't eat, right? Uh, Francisco Hernandez in Antigüedades de la Nueva España in 1571 uh, wrote that hardly anything is found that escapes the veracity of those men or their palate. So when he's talking about this, when he writes about this in 1571, what he's, he, he's actually describing the, the Amerindians eating frogs and insects. Now, <laughs> When we're thinking about frogs and insects, uh, it's not something that we normally think of in our diet. Now, uh, I, I will back up just a step and say that I do enjoy frogs' legs myself. Uh, um, I, I had, we, we ate quite a few different things when I was a kid. Um, I, I mentioned to others that are maybe listening right now that uh, when I grew up, I ate a lot of Chinese food, Indian food, uh, Mexican food, you know, food from all over the world. Uh, and I was not really necessarily afraid to try new things. And one thing that I was able to try at the, uh, what, Nine Old San Antonio, a part of Fiesta in San Antonio. You know, if, if you're familiar with San Antonio, you know they have like a 10-day event uh, in late April every year. And a big part of that event is uh, where they block off this area around La Villita and downtown. And they have all these different foods there. And I tried frog's legs and I thought they were really good, actually. Uh, so... The, the Europeans are thinking that frogs are pretty disgusting, toads are really disgusting, uh, and certainly the insects are disgusting. Now, I'm guessing that most people watching this video probably agree with that, but again, we're coming from this European perspective where insects are being eaten and it just seems really nasty. Now, in fact, in today's world, around two billion people consume insects, right? That's almost a third of the world does eat insects. Uh, there are some great benefits to eating insects. Uh, insects tend to be very high in protein, very low in fat. Uh, they, they're close to where you live, right? You don't necessarily have to go a long ways to find insects. Uh, I remember growing up, uh, I went to a summer camp one time when I was 15 years old, I believe. Actually, I think it was younger than that. Uh, I might have been eight or nine years old uh, for the, in this scenario. And I remember catching grasshoppers, right? I would catch grasshoppers be, because we're going to use them for fishing. Uh, I, I never thought about catching grasshoppers because I wanted to eat them. But for your diet, maybe we should be, right? Uh, if we think about grasshoppers and crickets and, and around 2,000 other species of insects that are around today, um, we have high protein content. Uh, crickets in particular uh, are considered a complete protein because it contains all nine essential amino acids. Uh, these amino acids are considered essential because you have to get them and not many foods have all of those essential amino acids. Uh, they, they bring in all kinds of uh, uh, minerals and vitamins that you don't get from other foods all in one place. So insects a lot of times are really, really healthy. Uh, but Europeans weren't used to eating insects. Now keep in mind that Europe, European geography and the environment tends to be a bit cooler. So you don't see as many insects up there as you will in warmer climates where insects can last year round. Uh, and that plays a role into why these Amerindians, people in Africa, people in South, Southern Asia eat insects. 
So we kind of come in with this European mindset that insects are bad to eat. But in fact, for nutrition purposes, uh, there's a lot of great benefits to eating insects. Uh, but again, this is this contrast of European and indigenous attitudes toward food. But again, I, I bring this map back into uh, to view because I wanna make sure we understand again that they don't have the cows, sheep, or pigs that Europeans are eating. So they are used to eating a very different diet. Now we also wanna make sure you understand that you know, the, the term you are what you eat today is pretty common, uh, right? That, that's something that's said uh, pretty frequently in telling you that you should eat healthy. Uh, and if you eat uh, bad foods, you're not gonna be healthy. Uh, you're you're going to have high cholesterol. You'll have heart problems. You may get diabetes. You, know, you have all these different consequences. Uh, but when the Spanish and the Europeans are thinking about you are what you eat, they are literally saying that the food that you are eating is transitioning you. Right? They're changing those humors. So this man, Pedro Arias de Benavides, uh, wrote. It's a very long title. I just have the very first part, you know, Secretos de uh, Chirurgia Especial, etc. It says, Amerindians don't have the same humors as us because they don't eat the same foods, right? Uh, so Galen's ideas, these, these four humors, the yellow bile, black bile, blood, and phlegm, uh, those apply to everyone. But according to Benavides, the four humors are superior in Europeans than they are to the Amerindians because the Amerindians don't eat the same diet. Uh, so uh, so they, they're, again, they, they are affected by this diet so that they're not quite the same type of person. Not, not, from, not from your own, in, in our thinking, genetic makeup, right? Of course, they don't use the concept of genetics. They're still using Galen's theory. Uh, and Enrico Martinez wrote in 1606, through eating new foods, people who come here from different climates create new blood, right? Uh, these new foods create new blood. And this produces new humors. And these new humors give rise to new abilities and conditions. So again, this will work both ways. If, if the Europeans wanna make the indigenous people better and more like them, you have to change their diet. That diet comprises who they are. Vice versa, if Europeans make their way over to the Americas and they start eating indigenous foods, then they will become more like the indigenous people. And they don't want that to happen. So what they have to do, if they want to stay who they are and not you know, basically slide back, uh, then they really have to bring over wheat and other items that the Amerindians didn't have access to because you want to protect who you are and make sure that you're still strong and, and viable. Now, we're going to kind of push forward because, again, part of the European strategy, or Spanish strategy in particular, and expanding to the Americas uh, was, was to spread religious ideas, right? They're coming out of this uh, era where they were under Moorish occupation all the way up until January of 1492. So they become very aggressively Catholic, removing uh, the Islamic and Jewish populations or forcing them to convert. And once they go around the world in the late 1400s and 1500s, they're going to take that mentality to these new areas and say, it's our job to kind of cleanse the area for God, right? We want to kind of praise God by converting the masses and the indigenous people over to us. But how do you know that they're Christian? Well, you know they're Christian by their faith, by how they dress, how they appear, and by what they're eating. So, this man, Tomas Lopez Medel, uh, kind of indicates, this, you know, writes these, uh, uh, th this letter or this uh, publication in 1551 that basically says that we're trying to improve the indigenous people. Uh, we're trying to make them ideal Christians. We want them to be God-fearing men. And they're doing better, right? They're, they're progressing. But a big problem that's, that's holding them back is that they keep eating the same foods, right? We want them to eat wheat, the food that we're bringing over here. 
keep in mind that we're used to uh, taking communion with you know, wheat-based crackers or something, right? They're not using corn necessarily for something like that. So wheat is part of the religious diet. Uh, so in order for these people to become more Christian and be more like Jesus Christ, you have the foods that Jesus Christ ate and the foods that the Catholic Church are promoting. So uh, as a result, again, we will start seeing a lot of food being imported, right? We're, we want to kind of strengthen uh, our own faith and convert those who are over there. This becomes very expensive. And keep in mind that not everybody can afford to import food. And those who don't import it directly themselves can't afford to buy the imported food, right? It's gonna be much more expensive. You're talking about uh, basically like a two month journey across the Atlantic Ocean to get the food from Europe over to the Americas. So right there, you're gonna start seeing these class distinctions because those who could afford the food are going to get the food and they'll see kind of a separation in, in status and separation in diet. So the people who have more money are, are more likely to buy European based foods and people who have less money can't do it. So you kind of start seeing this separation socially where the people who have money appear to be Christians and they're eating European foods and the people who don't are eating the indigenous foods and they're becoming more backwards, right? Their, their blood is changing because of what they're eating. Now, food is something that's considered by the indigenous people as well as a way to kind of identify themselves, right? Part of the problem that Medell had was that these indigenous people had their own taste. They've been eating the same foods their whole life. And now the Europeans are trying to change that. They're bringing in new foods and forcing them to eat wheat instead of corn, stuff like that. So we're gonna see these revolts in the 16th and 17th centuries among Mayans and Pueblo. Pueblo revolts, of course, in 1680 was very significant. And part of these revolts was to destroy anything that appeared to be European, including stocks of food. Uh, in, the, in Mayan revolts in the late 1500s, in fact, uh, they would kill fellow Mayans who were eating wheat. So if you were a Mayan eating a wheat, then you're basically saying, I'm one of them. So they would kill fellow Mayans who were becoming more European because of what they ate. Now, as we kind of make our way through the 18th and 19th centuries, the Bourbon dynasty will take over Spain. Uh, of course, the Bourbons uh, also ruled France. So we're gonna see kind of this Spanish-French relationship kind of mold what the Spanish empire is like as we go into the early 19th century. Uh, and we'll see more of this European influence as we get into this era. Uh, when we get to the 1800s in particular, we're gonna start seeing a lot of French influence when we're talking about Mexican food. Um, so you'll see, let's say, let's say for example, pan dulce, you know, sweet Mexican bread, right? If you go to Esperanzas in Fort Worth, uh, just a couple of miles from the library there. Uh, there's a great bakery there. And the food that you look at, if you look at that sweet bread, it looks a lot like French, bread, or French uh, pastries too, right? That French influence is going to influence the food that the Mexican people are making. But again, you'll see kind of that class division where uh, people who have more money are gonna be more influenced by that diet, while the people who have less money uh, start eating things like tacos, right? You start seeing the rise of tacos and burritos in the late 1700s and the early and the 1800s. And when you see these tacos and burritos rise up, while the, the Mexican elites are starting to be more influenced by French foods, then you start seeing kind of this claim by Europeans that tacos and burritos represented a lower class of people. And later on, they're gonna become this indigenous threat. Uh, so in particular, when we get to the late 19th century in Mexico, uh, and by the way, I've Maximilian just as representative of uh, French influence when we get to the 1860s. Uh, but when we get to the late 19th century, Porfirio Diaz will lead Mexico, uh, very much influenced by European culture. He had this group of scientificos uh, that basically tried to make Mexico more modern. And when they're saying more modern, we're basically saying more European. So 
there was concerns about tortillas, right? Uh, because tortillas were really a food of the indigenous people. Originally, they're going to be maize or, or corn tortillas, but we'll start seeing the rise of wheat flour tortillas over time. That's gonna be a twist of European value. Uh, but even eating tortillas themselves became problematic. So what winds up happening by the early 1900s is you'll see these French cookbooks that will start telling you to make tacos using crepes. So what you see here is an image of a taco using a crepe. Again, much more French than it is uh, indigenous when we're talking about crepes being used to wrap your meats. Uh, or in the case of burritos, you might be bringing in uh, rice and beans also. So we see this influence of the Cienticos. Uh, you'll see uh, this Francisco Bulnes in 1899 write, the race of wheat is the only truly progressive one. Right? Maize has been the eternal pacifier of America's indigenous races and the foundation of their refusal to become civilized. So they're saying that if you're eating maize-based foods, if you're eating corn-based products, you're essentially rebelling against European rule and trying to stick with indigenous culture. Uh, and if we're gonna be one country and one strong unified country, then we should all be eating the food, same types of foods and progressing similarly, not creating this distinction based upon your diet. We'll talk briefly about the Puerto Rican influence, right? So when we're talking about Mexico, we, we don't see this huge influx, influx of African slaves. Um, there's a huge indigenous population even today in Mexico across the nation. Puerto Rico is a much smaller territory. And again, Columbus is in Puerto Rico by 1493. So we're gonna have early Spanish influence there and they'll bring a lot of diseases. Uh, so the Taino people were the people that we see in Puerto Rico. Now the Puerto Rican diet is gonna be very much influenced by the existing population along with the European population and the African slaves, right? This is gonna be different than your Mexican influence. So rice was initially used to feed the African slaves that were being brought in during the 16th century. Remember, rice was not an American food. Rice was basically brought over from Africa and Europe. So when the rice is being produced, it's mainly there to sustain the slaves. And the slaves, of course, are there to work these plantations owned by Spanish people uh, in Puerto Rico. And the Taino population is almost brought to extinction as uh, during this period of time, as we see these Spanish people and these slaves bringing in uh, new diseases and just wiping out thousands and thousands of Tainos in the Caribbean, in Puerto Rico and specifically. So some credit is going to go to the Africans for helping the Taino people survive. Uh, the Africans will help preserve Taino culture, they'll help, uh, create new dishes, new foods that will use uh, beans that the Taino people were, uh, that they had as part of their diet. Of course, the Spanish are bringing in the rice and then we start bring, uh, mixing this rice and these beans together. Uh, then we start seeing kind of this rise of, of uh, new foods in Puerto Rico. I have this table here that shows the number of slaves. Right? This is gonna be, Esclavos is gonna be your slave, um, slaves. Uh, there's your negros, morenos, mulatos, right? Uh, here's your white population right over here. Uh, so this is going to be your population of slaves as we kind of move through uh, the mid-19th century. And you'll start seeing a decline, of course, when we get later on in the 19th century. Uh, of course, here's your rice imported by Spain to feed the laborers. Habichuelas is going to be a, a food that will uh, basically include a lot of red beans that are brought over. Uh, viandas are going to be very popular in the um, Puerto Rican diet as well. They'll use a lot of starchy root vegetables and fruits, including sweet potatoes, plantains, and cassava. All of these are American foods that will be retained basically in the Caribbean. Uh, cassavas in particular will be used to make bread. Uh, and that's going to be really significant because cassava bread can last up to three years, right? So you can get, you can make cassava bread cassava bread will last for a long, long time. So when you're exploring deep inland, uh, whether it be in the islands in the Caribbean or going into mainland America, uh, it's nice to have that cassava bread with you because you don't know how long it's gonna be until you can actually 
basically produce more food and get more food. Uh, if you use wheat-based bread, it's going to go out within a couple of weeks, right? That, but that uh, cassava bread will be significant. So just in, just one example of food that we see today that will be an example that will show this influence of Spanish, African, and indigenous populations would be something like this, right? Arroz con uh, gandules. This is a Puerto Rican rice with pigeon peas. Right? This is going to be a result of this these influences of these three cultures, African, Spanish, and indigenous population, which results in arroz con gandules. Now again, this is gonna be your map of exploration. Uh, we can see later on, after the Europeans have made their way, we'll see a, a, a exploration coming primarily from, cent from the Caribbean and Central America. Uh, what we're gonna look at is Pizarro as he makes his way down. Because Pizarro, of course, will wind up conquering the Incan Empire and uh, set up uh, his position as ruler in what is now Peru. So we're gonna look a little bit at Peru in, in, a, in addressing this particular issue. Now in looking at Peru, we're gonna see this indigenous population really contribute towards the, the foods of the current Peru, uh, Peruvian diet. So you'll see things like potatoes, right? They're really well known for potatoes in Peru, uh, maize or corn, uh, a variety of peppers, right? This is all gonna be part of what the indigenous people were already eating uh, that the Europeans did not have with them when they made their way over. Uh, the Spanish, when they come over, they're gonna bring over beef, chicken, olives, grapes, and a bunch of other foods that they're gonna kind of bring into the Peruvian diet. Now, what's interesting about Peru also is this rise of Chinese and Japanese immigration. So we're talking about Chinese immigration we're going to say that in the mid 19th century, so between let's say 1849 and up to 1874, close to 100,000 Chinese immigrants made their way into Peru, uh, mainly working in cotton and sugarcane fields. So you'll see these uh, Chinese immigrants making their way over to basically be these coolies or, or low wage laborers. Uh, they will essentially replace a lot of slave labor. Uh, Peru uh, banned the slave trade in 1821, and then in 1854, they formally abolished slavery. So essentially what you see is this importation of Chinese labor to replace African labor that's no longer being brought in. Now, a lot of that population is going to die really quickly. By the time we get to the mid-1870s, the Chinese population has gone, is, is already down to less than 50,000, despite the fact that you had 100,000, and most of them were dying, not going back to China. So you had this really high mortality rate of this Chinese population. But by the time you got to the 1870s, about 11% of Lima, Peru's population was Chinese, right? Uh, so that's a fairly considerable percentage, considering this is an imported population over basically about a 25 year period of time. Now, when the Chinese come in, they bring in new oils, new frying techniques. They're going to start incorporating things like soy and ginger, things that you normally associate with the Chinese food diet. Uh, so that's going to be part that's going to be brought in. Now, after that, we're going to start seeing a rise of uh, these uh, white preference laws. So Peru will pass white preference laws in 1873 and again in 1906. They're gonna, tr they're gonna try to stop Chinese immigration from coming in. You know, the United States is gonna do something similar, right? 1882, the United States establishes the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, so we're not gonna allow Chinese people to come in after 1882. Peru's basically gonna do something very similar when we get to the 1870s. So you're not gonna see much Chinese immigration coming in anymore, but you already have that population in place and that influence is already there. So we have this Chinese population move in. Uh, <clears throat> And then to satisfy the desires of, of planters, uh, people who are in big agriculture, we're now gonna start, start seeing Japanese immigration. Again, this is very similar to the United States. If you follow US history, you know that around the mid 1890s, uh, up into the very early 1900s before the gentlemen's uh, agreement, we see this rapid influx of, China, of, of Japanese immigration as well. So we're gonna see that 
Japanese immigration that's coming to the United States, you're gonna see a very similar migration going into Peru, but for a longer period of time. So this table shows, uh, or this graph rather, shows what uh, Japanese immigration was like, right? Again, not to the extent that the Chinese immigration was coming in, but certainly you'll see 1,000 to 3,000 people come in in several different years. Now, this Japanese immigration is very significant when we look at Peruvian dishes today, right? Japanese are willing to start using seafood. And seafood wasn't something that Peruvians, the indigenous population, the Spanish population, or the Chinese population were really eating a lot of. But now we're gonna start seeing seafood become a big part of the Peruvian diet. So I have a couple of dishes to show you uh, that kind of show history essentially on a plate or on a dish, right? Uh, this is lomo saltado. This is gonna be a, a very popular Peruvian dish. You can see the meats, you can see the spices, you can see the rice, you can see the potatoes, right? This is all these different cultures kind of mixed together. And then what Peru's really well known for is ceviche, right? Ceviche uh, peruano is, is uh, depicted here. There's different ways to cook this. But generally speaking, when you have ceviche, you really want to use raw fish. And where do we think of raw fish? What's the first food we think of when we think about raw fish? Sushi. And where do we get sushi? Japan. So this ceviche dish that we have today in Peru, again, is going to be very much influenced by the Japanese population that moves into Peru in the early 20th century. Now ceviche already existed, but it didn't necessarily include this raw fish that the Japanese are going to bring in. So again, this is uh, very significant, right? We see this influence from all these cultures, uh, the indigenous, Spanish, Chinese, and Japanese cultures are all forming what Peruvian food and culture is in today's world. Now, Argentina, I'm not gonna spend too much time on Argentina. I'm just using this more of a contrast. Now, of course, Argentina will have that ind indigenous population. They'll have that Spanish influence. They'll have the African influence. So right, all of that we've already talked about with Puerto Rico. And to some extent, we're gonna have that in Peru as well. But what Argentina is really well known for is their Italians. So that Italian immigration is gonna be highly significant when we get to the late 19th century and into the 20th century. So this is European immigration to Argentina by nationality. And you can see that you know, by 1870, Italians outnumber any other immigrant group, including Spain, uh, all the way into the mid 20th century. So this Argentinian population is really high. By the time we get to the early 20th century, over 60% of Argentinians have some Italian ancestry. Over 60% of Argentinians have some Italian ancestry. Between 1857 and 1940, approximately 45% of immigrants in Argentina were Italian. So we have a huge population of Italians uh, in Argentina. So understand that when you think about Italian food, you're gonna see that Italian food, food influence Argentina. Uh, when we think about Italian food, we think about pasta, right? Uh, so we're gonna look at a couple of things here. Now, I have this map up here, just to make sure you're familiar with this Moorish empire. Uh, the Moorish Empire goes well into the 15th century. They will, at times, have an influence in Italy, uh, Spain, across the Mediterranean. So when we're talking about Italy, we're talking about people who are sailing across the Mediterranean, and you'll see a lot of influence from the Middle East because of that. So you'll see things like alfajores and pasta frola two big keys of Argentinian delicacies, right? These are gonna be desserts or pastries. Now, alfajores uh, have origins in the Middle East and they were introduced to Spain originally in the eighth century. Uh, this comes from an Arabic word meaning luxurious. So when we're talking about this particular food, we're talking about a food that is celebrated in Spain uh, that's really influenced by the Middle East. So it's Middle East moving to Spain and Spain moving to Argentina and boom, we now have a dessert that Argentina specializes in. Then we have pasta frola. Now again, when you think about Italian, you think about pasta. Uh, so this dessert uh, is 
originally from Italy. It's basically kind of shaped into Argentinian cuisine in the 19th century, uh, and it'll use, again, that Italian influence. Now, again, we're talking about this expansion over to the Americas. I also want to address a little bit of Europeans. I don't want to spend too much time here because I know I've already been going for a while, but we'll go ahead and move on to France. Now, France didn't really trust some of the foods that the Americas were sending over. In particular, they didn't trust potatoes. Uh, potatoes grow underground and they come from the nightshade family. Uh, they, they are potentially dangerous, right? If you eat their leaves, then you could get sick, right? Uh, so, and there were concerns that potatoes might be leading to leprosy. So in 1748, the French parliament banned potatoes. They thought of it as a dangerous food. Using these religious notions, there's also concerns that food that grows underground might also be dangerous. Because when you think about things that are underground, you kind of think about hell. Right? You think about uh, not heaven. You think about something that's dead, not something that's alive. So potatoes are to be banned in France from 1748 to 1772. Until we get to this guy named Antoine Auguste Parmentier. Uh, this is a depiction of Parmentier over here. Uh, Parmentier was a, uh, a doctor in the French military. He was taken captive during the, during the Seven Years' War. So he spent a lot of time with Prussia. And he, Prussia was really eating a lot of potatoes. Uh, they, they, the potatoes were a big part of their diet, and nobody seemed to be dying from the potatoes. In fact, the Prussian army is one of the strongest armies in the world at that time, possibly the strongest army in Europe. They're right up there. So obviously, if the, one of the strongest armies in the world is basing their diet on potatoes, then potatoes must be pretty good, right? You're kind of putting two and two together. So after he's released, he goes back to France, and he starts promoting potatoes. So I like to refer to Parmentier as the Forrest Gump of potatoes. If you've ever seen the movie Forrest Gump, Forrest Gump goes on, I'm sorry, Forrest Gump has a friend. I shouldn't put Forrest Gump. I should say Bubba. Uh, so I need to change that. <laughs> but, but Forrest Gump has a friend, I think his name was Bubba, who uh, always talked about shrimp, right? Shrimp kebabs, shrimp tacos, shrimp whatever, right? Uh, that's basically what Parmentier starts doing in the 1770s, 80s, and 90s. He starts promoting potatoes. So he has publications that he wrote in the late 1700s where he'd say, potatoes are great. They make you strong. Uh, I think I've got uh, just something real quick that he wrote. He, he writes about this particular woman. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm probably need to get bifocal soon. But, <laughs> but uh, he basically says that there's this woman who wasn't eating, she was sick, it looked like she might be about to die, but then she started eating potatoes, and she was so happy from the effects that she recovered, quote, to her gaiety, plumpness, and appetite in a short time, end quote, as a result of potatoes. So potatoes, according to Parmentier, saved her life, right? She wouldn't eat anything else, she was weak, she was sick, but potatoes had this miracle value and saved her life, and he talks about all these different things you can do with potatoes. You can eat them, uh, you can boil them, you can fry them, you can put them in soups, you can make a broth, you can do all these different things with potatoes. And he just goes on and on and on about potatoes. So uh, he convinces the French parliament to remove that ban of potatoes and potatoes will become part of French cuisine. Uh, we look at England. Now England, we, England, the English government oftentimes will fight potatoes. Uh, because England's not growing the potatoes before this. Uh, so the wheat farmers basically have a lot of influence in parliament and they're going to try to weaken the influence of potatoes. But in the 1790s, we see this wheat shortage. And just to show you what we're talking about, uh, this is going to be the cost or average price of wheat for Winchester bushel in England and Wales uh, between 1793 and 1797 by month. If we look at 1793 and 1796, you can see it's basically around five or six, you know, around six shillings per bushel. Uh, if we go to 1795, we can see it spike up to like 13. So we see a, more than twice the price uh, of wheat in 1795, and the prices stay really high up through 1796. So what, we're, what England's going to do 
or is what some people will do is say, we need to start pushing for potatoes, right? We can start using potato bread. We can start using potato grains and make uh, things out of that. We don't need to focus on wheat. In fact, potatoes are pretty cheap. So he goes on to write uh, a couple of scriptures. Uh, so this, this particular author, John Forster, basically says that God is sending this to save us. And here's a couple of Psalms from the Bible that tell us uh, that he is giving us this food to make us better and help the poor, right? And it, so this is going to be part of a push in England to expand the use of potatoes to replace wheat. Now, bear in mind, Ireland is already using a lot of potatoes. Now, we'll kind of close off by just addressing just a few things regarding how the foods have kind of affected the world. Uh, because what I haven't really mentioned yet is Asia and the effects on Asia. So we know that France is going to be affected. We know Ireland for sure is going to be protected. Um, uh, affected. Prussia is really eating a lot of potatoes. Uh, we know in today's world that Italian food is using those to that tomato base. Uh, but how about Asia? Well, how about China? We'll look at China real quick. So China, this is going to be relatively current numbers for China. Uh, they are the number one producers of potatoes altogether, right? Uh, by far, almost 89 or right around 89 million metric tons uh, on a yearly basis. When we look at sweet potatoes, over 70 million metric, uh, of, I'm sorry, over 70 million metric tons on an annual basis. Um, if we look at global corn, United States and China are one and two. So China is again second in corn, but again, uh, corn and potatoes were not part of this Chinese diet, a uh, part of Chinese agriculture up to this point. So this again is very significant as we kind of move forward. Now, as a result, we're gonna see these population booms in Asia and Europe. China is what we're looking at here. So again, it's gonna be in the 1800s that you start seeing corn and potatoes become part of the Chinese diet. And at that point, you really see that population escalate, right? China's the, you know, by far the biggest country in the world popu by population. And that indigenous food is really gonna help them populate. Again, that's not the only thing that's influencing it, but it's a big part of why the Chinese population booms. You could say the same thing about European population, right? It's, it's gonna be, you know, right around the 1600s that you start seeing indigenous foods kind of make their way over to Europe, become more widely spread. And of course, potatoes by the mid to late 1700s across Europe are going to feed the multitudes. So it's gonna be right in that 17th century, 18th century timeframe when those indigenous foods are going over to Europe and China that we see those populations really expand. So essentially what we're saying is that indigenous, this, these indigenous foods are really helping the world grow. They're sustaining health, they're providing nutrition, uh, they are influencing culture, diets. Uh, we are who we are today as a result of this combination of European and indig indigenous foods wherever you are around the world, whether you're in Asia, Europe, the Middle East, Africa, North America, South America, we're all influenced by this transaction of culture and food today. Uh, that is all I have for today. So I guess at this point, we will open it up to questions. So. Please don't be shy. Please jump right in if anyone has any questions. Okay, we have one question and uh, our guest is asking, how does environmental impact correlate with- Environmental impact. Uh, there's a- Big impact on the environment. Are you talking about historically or are you talking about currently? Um, I, I guess I can probably answer that more in a historical context than I can currently. Um, because when you talk about environmental impacts, you can go back to Mayan civilizations in the Yucatan and Central America uh, and how the Spanish came. And of course, you're going to see a lot of deforestation when that happens. And when you have these, this deforestation, you see population loss. So while European populations are growing, uh, the indigenous population that's relying upon the environment around them winds up dying out. Uh, so, 
and, and there were a lot of problems when the Spanish came because they, they were very reluctant to grow the foods that were meant to be in the Americas, that were naturally in the Americas. And they wind up basically trying to grow wheat where they shouldn't be growing wheat. And then you see soil erosion and you see other problems. And uh, also they, they limited, the Spanish limited land to the indigenous people. So a lot of the indigenous people actually died from starvation in combination with their sicknesses too. Uh, so the misuse of land by the Europeans coming into the Americas really has some very adverse effects to the indigenous population. I, I hope that addresses the question, at least to some extent. Thank you. Um, we have another question, which is, uh, where did coffee originate? Um, was it in Central America? And, and also, were, were potato, if you would clarify whether potatoes originated in America or originated in Ireland? Oh, potatoes definitely originated in the Americas, uh, most likely South America, most likely somewhere around Peru, uh, and they'll expand up from that point. Uh, when the Spanish came, uh, you notice uh, in Mexico and in Central America, uh, they had potatoes, but the potatoes are really small and they didn't eat them a whole lot. Uh, but when you're looking at Peru, you have all these different varieties of potatoes and they're very big. Uh, interestingly, when the Europeans start to grow potatoes, uh, the land wasn't accustomed to it yet. It wasn't, it, it, basically the potato goes into shock. And when the Europeans try to grow potatoes, they come out like little berries uh, at first. Uh, so the land basically had, or the potatoes basically had to acculturate to the land itself to become successful in Ireland and other places. So yes, they absolutely originate in the Americas, uh, most likely South America going into Central America and then kind of spreading up to North America. Uh, and then what was the other part of that question? Uh, the- Where did coffee originate? Coffee. I believe coffee originated in the Northern part of South America, but I could be a little bit off on that. I, I'm, I'm fairly certain it's gonna be probably around where Colombia is. When you think about Colombian coffee, I believe coffee is going to originate right around that area, the northern part of South America. Okay. Um, next question, uh, and, and this was one of my, my questions I was going to ask. Uh, where can we find some more resources on this topic? Do you have some suggestions about certain, certain books or, or certain archives that contain a lot of information about food and food resources? Um, there are two particular authors that I would recommend. Uh, the first one is Rebecca Earle. Uh, her, her last name is E-A-R-L-E. -E. Rebecca Earle writes extensively on this. Uh, and the other one, let's see if I, I can't remember his name. He, um, he wrote a book called Planet Taco. And I've written, I've, I've read that book and I think two other books of his. But if you look up who wrote Planet Taco, you'll see his name. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick. Uh, Jeffrey Pilcher. Pilcher is the name. So uh, Rebecca Earl and Jeffrey Pilcher are the two that I would look for. Okay. Uh, next question is that... Um, you mentioned the use of crepes and foods that resemble crepes. Is it fair to say that this was the creation uh, of enchiladas? Um, you know, I, I've, I've tried to look up the history of enchiladas in the past, and I don't remember coming up with a, a really good explanation. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if kind of the, that finagling of different uh, ingredients and ways to make tacos in a more European style uh, created that. I would think there's a, I, I wouldn't say that the crepe part would be accurate, uh, but trying to create an indigenous food in a more European manner, I think is certainly, uh, would certainly contribute to that. Uh, and and the, a lot of those French chefs that came to Mexico in the you know, early to mid 19th century, they will come up with all, you know, mole, for example, uh, when you think about mole, mole is my favorite food growing up. Uh, and my, my grandmother used to make it. And boy, that, that was my, I would eat like three plates of mole with rice and beans. Uh, but that's really going to kind of come up with these French chefs that are trying to utilize indigenous foods and spices. 
We're getting some other comments from folks that love Mole. <laughs> um, let's see. Next question is uh, the huge population increase, for example, in China on the chart. Was that also influenced by antisepsis uh, developments in science to help prevent or cure diseases? Uh, when you get to the late 19th century, you'll see that much more so. So that will certainly help. Um, uh, keep in mind, germ theory isn't really prevalent until we get to like the mid to late 19th century. And uh, we, we really don't become that great at medicine, uh, com com comparably speaking, until we get to around the 1870s, 1880s. Uh, so absolutely, the combination of food with medical developments will help Chinese and other populations expand and basically in, in improve and increase lifestyle, a life, life uh, expectancy. Okay. Okay. Linda, do you, uh, have you seen any other questions come in? Oh, Linda would like to answer this question live. Please do. No, I was just going through so I could, uh, Get those out of the queue. Ah, sorry. Okay. No, um, I'm not seeing any other questions come in. Uh, Linda, do you see any more? I do not. Okay. Well, if no one has any other questions, um, I just want to tell you, Peter, that we're getting lots of really good comments about how uh, interesting this program has been. Um, oh, wait, I, I will, uh, I have one other question that is uh, in one of uh, the comments that says, uh, what's going to happen in China when there is another potato famine? <laughs> uh, I don't know if I can answer the future. Um, <laughs> I, I will say the, that not only, but corn is also very sustaining in, in China. There's large uh, territories in China where corn is the staple in their diet. Um, so there's other foods that you can use to replace it. One of the fantastic things about this exchange of foods is that there's other foods that can replace foods that go short. Uh, so um, I, I would say that there'd be solutions. Uh, you may have a, a rough year or two, but I would think that uh, you could probably make up for it. Okay, well, uh, I want to thank all of our guests that chimed in today uh, to uh, be and, and logged in to be with us. Uh, we've, we've had great participation. And again, I want you to be sure and join us on October the 10th when Brian Cervantes is here to talk about Eamon Carter. Um, I'll ask Linda and and Peter to please stay on the line with us uh, for a few moments, but uh, everybody else, we just appreciate it and hope that you will have a terrific afternoon. Bye-bye. Right, thank you guys.